let's consider the case of a moving magnet one more time let's set up that magnet on top of a spaceship and we're going to look at this from two different points of view we're going to have an observer that sees the spaceship moving with the magnet on the roof and the spaceship is moving with a velocity v as we said before Faraday's law says that in addition to the magnetic field of the magnet there should be also an electric field around the magnet so for this observer there is an electric field and there is a magnetic field if the observer was holding a charge for example that charge will experience a force due to the electric field that is surrounding the magnet and if the observer was holding a compass that compass will be deflected by the magnetic field of the magnet now the same magnet mounted on top of the ship as seen by the an observer moving with the spaceship it does not have an electric field with it, uh, near it for that observer the magnet is not moving therefore there is only a magnetic field near the magnet so there is only B field no electric field so electromagnetism is showing us with this little example that observers do not always agree on what kind of fields are present in space for this observer the electric and magnetic field are both present for an observer moving in a different way there is no electric field and only B is present similar example goes with uh, the motion of a charged particle as seen by observers moving in different ways so say that you mount a, a charge on a truck and you measure whether there is electric and magnetic fields uh, coming from this charge we know that there is an electric field for sure because they, that is the case for any charge object there is an electric field that is uh, if the charge is positive comes out of the charge but Bill Savar's law tells us that if the truck is moving with a velocity v you would also expect a magnetic field to curl around the uh, trajectory of the, of the charge of these are the magnetic field lines of the object generated by the motion of that charge so once again for this observer there are both an electric field and a magnetic field for an observer moving or sitting on the truck not moving with respect to the charge clearly there is only one field and that is the electric field of the charge so for this observer only E no B So this is yet another example of observers disagreeing on what fields are present. Now let's keep making things a little bit more strange. Now let's have these two observers, one say moving in a plane, holding two charges, let's say positively charged. And let's give a name to this observer, let's say that his name is Bill, and there is a second observer that is not moving with respect to ground and let's call him Albert so both Bill and Albert are interested in what are the forces uh, between those particles so from Bill's point of view there is only electric repulsion like charges repel so the electric force is in this direction so he measures electric repulsion between the charges. Let's say there is a strong electric repulsion. Now what is the situation from Albert's point of view? From Albert's point of view, the charges do repel each other as before. There is an electric force between them, but they are also moving. Those charges have a velocity, the velocity of the plane. 
moving charges, as we said before, according to Bill Savar's law, have a magnetic field around them, and that magnetic field it's going to put a force on the other charge. You can think of these two charges, moving charges, as being equivalent to two currents, two wires with current in the same direction. We've seen that there is an attractive force going on between those two wires when the currents the same. So there is a magnetic force in addition to the electric force between the two charges there is a magnetic force uh, from Bill's point of view. Now the charges still repel each other but less strongly in Albert's uh, system of reference than in Bill's system of reference. Now this means starts to uh, to mean something very strange. It starts to take us to very strange places because a strong force implies a big acceleration. So the charges in Bill's system of reference move away from each other very quickly. As seen from uh, by Albert, those charges do not move away from each other quickly. Depending on the speed at which Bill is moving, the magnetic and the electric forces uh, might be very similar in magnitude. Therefore, they, uh, you could have a repulsive force that is very, very weak. So that makes those charges move away from each other very slowly. So how is it possible that Bill sees the charges moving away quickly and Albert sees the charges moving away slowly? That seems to be uh, an extreme discrepancy between the observations of these two observers. Let's give Bill now a device that is going to measure the amount of time that it takes those charges to move over a certain distance. So the device has a track with stops at the end and two stops in the middle. Place the charges inside and connect this to a say stopwatch. and let's put a trigger here so what the trigger is going to do is that when you pull on the trigger these two stops go down the charges are free to move now they will repel each other and when they reach the end of the track the stopwatch will stop so this device is going to measure the amount of time that it takes those charges to go from the middle to the end of the track. <clears throat> so now let's give this device to Bill. So now Bill is going to be, say, in an airplane, very fast airplane, and he's going to be holding the device. This is Bill over here. And now Albert, as before, is going to be standing on the ground, but he's going to call his cousins to come and help him make the time measurement. So what Albert wants to measure is how much time does it take those charges to move from the center of the device to the end of the device. How is he going to do that? Well, Albert and his cousins, they're all going to have stopwatches. And it has been agreed with Bill that when Bill flies over Albert, Bill is going to press the trigger, his stopwatch is going to start, and Albert's, Albert's going to do the same thing and start his stopwatch. His, cous his cousins are also going to do the same thing at the same time. Now, Bill moves to the right as the charges are separated, and when the charges reach the end of the track, we know that Bill's stopwatch is going to stop therefore making a measurement of the amount of time that it took those charges to reach the end of the device and whichever cousin Bill happens to fly over that is the cousin that is going to make it's going to stop his stopwatch 
therefore making a measurement of how much time it took those charges to move through that certain distance. So now Bill is going to have a measurement of uh, the amount of time and Albert is going to have his own measurement. Now how are these measurements related? Are they the same? Should, be, should they be the same? Well, if you think about what we said about the forces, as uh, seen by Bill and Albert, Bill sees a very strong repulsive force going on between those charges, which means that the charges, from Bill's point of view, move quickly, and they will reach the end of the track in an amount of time that should be less than the amount of time that it's going to take, as seen by Albert. Because remember that Albert sees a repulsive force that is weaker than Bill's repulsive force. So because the force is weaker, the charges do not repel each other very strongly, they move slowly, and they're going to take more time to reach the end of the track than the amount of time as measured by Bill. Now if we stop for a minute and think about this, this is something very strange. It's telling you that the same phenomenon, meaning the motion of the charges from the center to the end takes different amounts of time in different systems of reference. Suppose that in Bill's uh, system of reference that his measurement was one second, that it took the charges one second to reach the end. It is possible that in Albert's system of reference it actually takes two seconds. Once again, how is it possible that the same phenomena could take a different amount of time in different systems of reference. This phenomena, which is very real, is called time dilation. It implies that time does not flow at the same rate for all observers. And in fact, if you looked at the wall clock inside the moving ship, Bill's moving ship, it would seem to be moving slower. The wall clock, as seen by Albert, would seem to be moving slow because every second that passes inside uh, Bill's ship corresponds to two seconds uh, as uh, measured by Albert's clock. So that means that Bill's clock looks slower to Albert. While Albert's clock is showing two seconds, Bill's clock is showing one second only. Now this doesn't just apply to uh, the wall clock or to the stopwatch that Bill is holding, it applies to every physical process happening in that system of reference. That includes all his, the biological processes going on in his body, everything. <coughs> the fact that uh, for an observer seeing Bill uh, in which uh, Bill moves, the amount of time is bigger than the amount of time uh, as measured by Bill, this is called was time dilation, and it was first discovered and reported by Einstein in 1905. The way we have uh, arrived at it is not the same way that uh, Einstein used to get to this idea. What he used was actually the idea of the constancy of the speed of light. This is what ticked him off into thinking that time and space, the ideas of time and space, needed to be revised. 